Oh, come on, Isaac, with the Hammond organ, nice. <laughs> there's only one Hammond organ, and there's only one Isaac Rodriguez. Yeah, nice, nicely done, Isaac, awesome. Well, good morning, Hope. I, I'm really glad you're all here. I, I'm glad you made it to, to the service. I, I'm not calling you off to punt. That's not what this is. <laughs> Pastor Jeremy's a Gophers fan, so at least be happy for him. Uh, he's the only, oh, oh two, I probably shouldn't have mentioned that. Now he's a target, right? Uh, we're, we're really happy for you, Pastor Jeremy. Thanks for rubbing that in my face <laughs> as we go. That's great. So what do you do when you face injustice, or injustice and, and, uh, and, and calls that are debatable? Um, that's maybe putting the best possible construction I can as somebody who church for Iowa. Uh, that, you know, pretty much lost the whole chance of a Big Ten championship game. But that's okay, I'm over it now. I, I, I'm moving on. More, more seriously, what do we do? Uh, as we read through the whole Holy Bible together as a church, these are questions that are first order questions of life. We're not talking about, we're not reading things that are just, here's some tips for, uh, you know, how, how to deal with a little bit of your stress. Here, here, here's some things that might help a little bit here and there. And it just makes me cringe when, when uh, Christians reduce the life-changing transfer, transformational message of Scripture into just some pithy sayings. Or some fortune cookie level kinds of, hey, you know, have you ever thought of this? Here's some advice. What we're talking about here is not just what we do, but who we are, our, our identity. And how that identity leads to behavior and, and how we're going to live out these lives that God has given to us as a gift. They're not earned. We don't deserve this. We're here for what the Bible refers to relative to eternity as a blink of an eye. But that blink matters. It matters a lot to God. It matters so much he sent his son Jesus into this world to, to die on our behalf, to, to give us a hope that we can't get apart from him. There, there, is, there is a message of scripture that rings true from Genesis all the way through Revelation, and it's this common thread. And as we read through that Bible together, we're not just becoming more biblically literate, we're becoming fluent, and hopefully we're learning how to read it and learn it and live it. We're learning how to apply it faithfully to our daily lives. And the world has nothing to fear about that. Christians who actually live out the, the Christian ethic, what Christ has exemplified for us to live out, have nothing to fear. What they, have, what they will have is people who love more, who give more, who serve more, who forgive more, who carry the same grace that Christ offers for us, and then it naturally overflows out of us to the world around us. As you've been reading through the scriptures this year, I'm sure, I know, I've talked to you, you're picking up on that theme. It comes in the podcast questions that you ask us every week. It comes as we prepare for these sermons. God's word goes out and it doesn't come back empty. So today we turn the page to uh, the letter, the epistle of James that he writes to the early Christian church. James is the younger brother of Jesus. He begins his letter. This letter is from James, a slave of God and a slave of Jesus Christ. I don't know how many of you have big brothers. I do. I would never start a letter with, I'm a slave to my big brother David. I just wouldn't do it. I love him, but I'm not a slave. Even though when I was in third grade, he kind of made me feel like it. That was a whole different deal, though. But James is the younger brother who sees something divine in his brother. He sees something more, and he knows and he believes. And so he's not just the brother I grew up with. He's, he's the brother that I put my trust and faith in as the son of God. He's writing to Jewish Christians living throughout Israel. He's writing toward the back half of uh, the 40s AD. He's writing in a way his influences are the book of Proverbs, and you can tell uh, as you read through it, because James, as opposed to all the other epistles we've read so far in the New Testament leading up to this last week, James is uh, better sipped than gulped. So don't think like, big gulp, I'm just going to devour this book. I'm going to do it as a speed read. James reads more like Proverbs, like a fine sparkling water, right? Like, a, like, 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 a, like a, something that just should be sipped a, a little bit at a time. That's the way Proverbs reads, the wisdom literature of the Old Testament. Here's, here's a thought, here's another thought, here's another thought, and they're loosely connected. 
James is a little bit more than loosely connected, but he writes with that style. He said, well, here's a sentence or two on this, and here's a sentence or two on this, and here's another sentence or two over here, but it wraps together like a good Seinfeld episode where you're watching the whole thing. You're like, none of these things relate to each other until the last scene. You're like, oh, I see how it all comes together. That's James. Sip on it. Take in the wisdom of God's timeless truth. He's using Proverbs as an influence. He's also using his brother's Sermon on the Mount. He was probably there, probably took careful notes. And the Sermon on the Mount is Jesus' commentary on the Torah, the first five books of, of what we call the Old Testament today. And so Jesus is saying, you've heard the law that says this, but I say to you, let me even raise the bar. You've heard the, the law that says an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth, but I say to you, turn the other cheek. You've heard the law that says um, uh, don't murder, but I say to you, don't even get angry. You've heard the law that says don't commit adultery, but I say to you, don't even have lust for another human being. Have more respect for them than that. So James is kind of in your face. It is deep. It is biblical timeless truth wisdom, but it's also to be sipped. But it's also aggressive, assertive at least. It's, It's challenging. And I want to be really clear up front. It isn't just like my challenge as one of your pastors for you today. It's God's challenge for us, myself included, and it is very challenging or we're not paying attention. So let's sip on James a little bit for the rest of this sermon. I'm going to walk you through some of the themes and the highlights. James is saying, here's the big themes. Activate your faith. Nowhere in James does he say faith alone doesn't save you, so put your theological swords away. It's okay. He says, since your faith saves you, now what are you going to do with that salvation? What are you going to do with that new life, that freedom that God gives to you? Jesus says, you know a tree by its fruit. If it isn't producing good fruit, there must be something wrong with the tree. So there must be something wrong with our faith if it doesn't lead to action, if it doesn't lead to good works. Good works don't save us, but good works are the result of salvation. That's what James is saying. He's flipping the script on instead of living for the world, we live for something higher. We remember who we are. For instance, he says, instead of the world always telling you you need to take more pride, healthy pride, yes. Unhealthy pride where it's arrogance and it's all about you and you're trying to draw attention to yourself all the time, not good. Not good for the world, not good for you, not good for me. Not good for any of us when our pride gets the best of us. Instead, find this pathway, this better way, the way of Jesus. Find find it in humility. He goes on to say, wealth isn't going to give you everything you think it is. In fact, it's kind of an illusion. It doesn't matter if you're rich or poor. You're going to need something deeper in order to have lasting joy. Criticism and slander of other people is easy. It's spiritually and emotionally lazy. Anybody can see what's wrong with something. That's not hard to do. James challenges us and he says, stop criticizing so much. Uh, Have perseverance, endure through the hard times. James would know about that. He's the leader of the church in Jerusalem in the middle of the first century when the Roman Empire is rising up and oppressing the Christians who are there, not happy that there are Christians there. James is the leader of this whole movement and so he is at the front lines of the oppression. But he perseveres and then James says, be perfect. Four times. In five short chapters of the epistle of James, it says, be perfect. And that's where we rightly should get really uncomfortable. Because you could say, boy, you know, if I've been here for years and years at Hope, I think I've heard a lot of sermons on the perils of perfectionism. uh, On how fully dependent we are on God's amazing grace through Jesus' death and resurrection in order to have any hope for eternity, how, how we aren't going to be able to get there on our own, how, how we need, because we aren't perfect, because we're all sinners in need of a savior, instead of pretending that we can be perfect, like Ned Flanders and the Simpsons. Don't be too hard on Ned. It's probably just the way he was raised. But Ned is Homer's neighbor, and Ned's sort of a holier-than-thou guy, and a howdy doody do do guy, or whatever he says, and he's got all these flippant sayings, and he reduces Christianity to a bunch of cliches, which is so often what people think about Christians from the outside looking in. It's just some sort of shallow, religious sort of pursuit, and there's no depth or substance to it. But God bless Ned. I mean, he was probably raised this way. He probably uh, was told, hey, Ned, pretend you're perfect. That's what, that's what religion is really all about. Pretend you can be something that nobody could be. Pretend you're a, you're, you're a perfect human being. You never make any mistakes. 
That's not what James is getting at when he says be perfect. He writes, specifically in the opening verses of this epistle, when your endurance is fully developed, when you go through the hard times like I, James, am going through, then you will be perfect. Let's take a look not at the English translation so much as the original Greek here in James chapter 1, verse 4. The Greek word is teleoi. Everyone say teleoi. <laughs> Just because it's fun. Teleoi, you know, like a telescope, like a telephone, like a television. It broadcasts. It goes out everywhere. It stretches out. A telescope that an old pirate would have, you stretch it out. If you only stretch it out a little bit, it doesn't reach its full potential. Reach your full potential, James is saying. Christian, child of God, follower of Jesus Christ, teleoi. Push it all the way to the edge. Rise up. No more excuses for sitting on the sidelines. No more excuses for saying somebody else will do it. No more excuses for saying, well, that's their problem because it's half a world away. Or, or it's, our, it's in a neighborhood I don't live in. That, that, that's their issue. I, I don't have any responsibility for that. James says, y your telescope's too limited. Stretch it out. Perfect it. Literally, teleoi means complete, whole, mature, fully grown and developed. It's reaching its full potential. It's the capacity of effectiveness. That's perfect. Literally, that's what James is talking about. And that's why it's so challenging. Because it's very tempting to say, I'd rather take the spiritually lazy path. Or everybody else does it. Where I sound like the world and I say, I have no responsibility for my neighbor. I, I, I don't have to love. I, don't, I, could, I only have to love the people who are nice to me. I only have to forgive the people who've earned it. I only have to have grace for the people I want to have grace for, and not the ones I don't. But that's not the, the way of Jesus, and James isn't going to let us take the easy road. And so as we sip on this epistle, he continually pushes our buttons and challenges us, but he does so not just for the sake of getting us to do more. He does it for the sake of those we do more for. But here's the beautiful part. He also does it because this is who we are. Look at what he says as we move on a little deeper into James. Verses 23 to 27 of this opening chapter. If you listen to the word of God and don't obey it, it's like glancing at your face in a mirror. You'll walk away and forget what you look like. Some of you are like, well, I'd like to walk away and forget what I look like when I glance in a mirror. Not everybody can be as attractive as you, Pastor Mike. I know that's what you're thinking. <laughs> totally kidding. You know that. But if we listen to God's word and we don't apply it, if we don't live it out, James is saying, if we aren't obedient to God's word, if we don't love the way Christ has loved us, if we don't care, if we don't answer the call to, to be caring, pure and genuine religion means caring for people who are left behind, for people that the world dismisses, for people who maybe don't rise up to whatever standard you have for, for their lives, because then we have, we have grace. Pure and genuine religion, living out our faith, means looking in the mirror, remembering who we are instead of saying, oh, my identity's in Christ, but walking around uh, off of the mirror a, a few steps further down the road of daily life, and we forget who we are. We just have a blank face. And then we say, okay, world, okay, culture, okay, society, okay, influencers, okay, anybody else, tell me who I am. Tell me what I'm supposed to be. Let me live with the wisdom of this world. Let, let, let me apply the best that this world has to give. Or we could find our identity in Christ, James says, and actually live it out, which means caring for orphans and widows in their distress and refusing to let the world corrupt us and tell us who we are and fill in the blank slates. If you've been watching the news in the Middle East this last week, and I preached in detail on this last week about what a faithful Christian response is, to, to the terrorism and, and, and to the threat of further war and, and, and death and, and suffering in the Middle East. Yeah, we can pray and we can take stands against evil and, and call evil evil, the Bible says, instead of calling it good or, or giving it a pass or dismissing it or trying to justify it. And so we'll, we'll do that. But we can also avoid the temptation to assume that every Palestinian is a part of Hamas. They're not. They're just not, despite what you might want it to be or what you hear it is, they're just not. And there are people who are being killed, who are Palestinians and who are Israelis. And our heart as followers, our hearts as followers of Jesus should be to care 
for all of them, for everybody who's in distress. And so last week we said pray about it, take stands against evil, uh, don't give it a pass, avoid the prejudice, but also don't just say thoughts and prayers. Actually activate your faith and do something about it. So we took a special offering for our mission partner that's already in the Middle East and has been for generations, Lutheran Disaster Response, and you gave so generously and abundantly that when you're watching the news this past week and you see those trucks waiting to get in the blockaded border of Gaza, some of the humanitarian aid in those trucks is from you, Lutheran Church of Hope. That's you in action. That's your generosity the hands and feet of Jesus coming in and breaking through. That's pure and genuine religion. That's what we're called to be. And I know we can make excuses. Well, say, oh, that's not my cause. Well, then find your cause and give to it generously. If, if this isn't the one that gets your heart going, that, that you have passion for, then find it. Because this is who we are. We don't get to vote on, on what our creator has created, on what our maker has made. What he has made according to his word is people to care, people to have compassion, people to not leave behind those who are hurting and in distress, people who refuse to let the world corrupt us or justify our ignorance or our dismissal or, or our saying, oh, well, it's all good. Let just everybody t t take care of this. If, if, if they're from a different neighborhood, if, if they're not seeing the world the same way I see it, if their worldview is different, then, then they have to fend for themselves. It's on them. Let's just take care of our own. And the Bible's very clear. Your own is every human being on the face of this earth and that doesn't mean any of us or any congregation can take care of every issue of distress on this earth but if the body of Christ would just wake up two and a half billion strong on planet earth today and just be the telescope that God has called us to be instead of letting it collect dust on a shelf my goodness the world would change the Bible says you're the body of Christ and I am too and we're individually members of it no more sleeping on the sidelines wake up church rise up and understand this is our identity this is who we are wow I'm getting passionate about that let me tone that down just a little bit nah you know I'm not doing it for that but if the church would just be and not become something we were never made to be just be who we are look in the mirror child of God look in the mirror follower of Jesus Christ remember who you are when you go to work when you go to school, when you hang out with your friends, when you come across that EGR, extra grace required to love them person in your life. Remember who you are. Remember who you're called to be. Pure and genuine religion means doing this, being a part of this. So we'll extend the special offering this week. And we give not just to help others, but we give because this is who we are. And the road to perfect isn't going to happen until, until we become who God has made us to be, until we hit our stride in that way. On the next screen, you'll see a picture of Rupert, who is the devil in Ted Lasso. He plays just the villain, the, the bad guy. Ted Lasso is a series uh, that's on Apple TV that I wish I could recommend to you, but I can't, and especially you shouldn't watch it with your kids. The language is atrocious. And it doesn't need to be. They didn't need to do that. I wish, wish they'd stop doing that. The stories are so good, some of them, but as some of the episodes are completely off the rails. So I'm just recommending this scene that I'm about to show you, where Rupert, the villain, picks a fight with Ted. Rupert is this guy. He's the prideful guy. He's the guy who gives special attention and good seats to the famous people, to the rich people. But you say to the poor one at the same time, at the same gathering, well, you can go sit on the floor because only the famous people deserve the good seats and the rich people. Well, and that's in the original Greek. I love that. James is like, well, don't you get it? Doesn't that show your discrimination? Doesn't that show that your judgments are guided by evil motives? That's Rupert. Boy, does he play the villain well. It's just easy to just so dislike him. His ex-wife is now the owner of the soccer team he used to own in the Premier League in, in England. And, and his wife hires Ted Lasso, a college football coach from a tiny little college in Kansas who knows nothing about soccer but is a motivational coach. And so Ted comes to England and he becomes the coach of this team. 
And Rupert picks a fight with him. On the next screen, you can see this. And James says, chapter 4, verse 1, what's causing the quarrels and the fights among you? James answers that in the next verse. He says, don't the fights that we have come from the evil desires that are war within us? We want what we don't have, so we scheme and kill to get it. We're jealous of what others have, but we can't get it, so we fight and wage war, wow, to take it away from them. Yet we don't have what we want because we don't ask God for it. And even when we ask, we don't get it because our motives are all wrong. We want only what will give us pleasure. What are you here for? To see what you can get from the world? Or to see what you can give? To see what you can consume from spirituality? Or to see what you can, how you can serve the brother of James? He says, I'm a servant of my brother, Jesus, the Son of God. To go his way, a pathway that extends the telescope to its full capacity? And so we hit our stride and we discover, oh, this is the life my soul's been longing for me to live ever since I was made, ever since I was created. Or the ways of the world which say selfish motives are fine. Selfish ambition and jealousy is fine. There's nothing wrong with ambition until it's selfish, until it's all about me. Or you pursuing these things for the sake of pursuing them. None of us is perfect, but we're called to extend the capacity of who God has made us to be so that we reach that potential, so that we live the life we were created to live, which starts by saying, jealousy and selfish ambition, I'm putting on that, that on the side. None of us can be perfect. Let's make this very clear. Whatever campus you're at uh, right now, whatever local site all around the Midwest, you're online at a soccer tournament, turn to the person next to you and say, you are so not perfect. Just go ahead and get that out right now. I'm glad you told each other. Now tell me, say, you're not perfect either. Yeah. Amen, brother, you got, that's right. It hurts a little, but it's true. None of us are perfect, but we're called on this pathway to extend, to give, to serve, to, to, to love, to be what God has made us to be. What causes the quarrels and fights among you? Too bad. We don't live in a context where you can relate to this. Because everybody in our community gets along. Everybody in our country gets along. There's no divisions. There's no brokenness. There's no separation. But imagine that there was. Imagine that there was brokenness amongst us. Imagine what's at the core of this, James says. Jealousy, selfish ambition, living your life for yourself instead of for the other. And that's what's keeping us from the hope that only God can provide. So Rupert picks a fight with Ted because he's against anything good. But what you need to know about Ted if you've never seen this show is he's the eternal optimist. And it's not because his life is charmed. His wife is divorcing him back home in Kansas. He misses his son terribly and he's an ocean away. His father died by suicide when he was 16. And he goes into therapy for the whole second season in order to work through that. The entire British sports press and media mocks him and ridicules him as some country bumpkin from Kansas in the United States who doesn't know the first thing about soccer. And yet Ted still smiles. He still has joy. He has something deeper. Because he's on a different pathway, and that pathway is, what can I do for you? How can I serve you? What can I do for us as a team? Instead of, what can I get from you? What can you give me? Ted's not a perfect person in a Ned Flanders sort of morally never makes a mistake way. I'm not saying that. But he's on a perfect pathway. And so he never loses his joy. What if your joy doesn't depend on your circumstances? What if the peace that passes all human understanding that we read about in Hebrews last week is something that God can give us as soon as we let go of selfish ambition and jealousy and we just pursue God's ambitions for us with everything we've got, all in? It's not about stepping back and being passive. Quite the opposite, James is saying. Activate your faith. 
activate your giving, activate your service, activate your grace for one another. Take a look at this scene where I edited out a few cuss words. So it'll be G-rated. But you'll see Rupert picking this fight. See if you can't find yourself and the temptations that are around you and me on a daily basis in this clip. You all leave. Don't want to give them satisfaction. So, Rebecca, it's time to be friends again. Especially since Bex and I are going to be sitting with you every week in that owner's box. I'm not going every week. <laughs> well, I am. And, um, every week when they shove a camera in my face and ask me how I think you're doing, I will tell them. It'll be relentless. <clears throat> so, Rupert, y'all take your darts over here pretty seriously, huh? Uh, they'll send, uh, What's the billiard game y'all do that sounds like a brand of cookies? Snooker? That's it. That's the one. Yeah, boy, I'd love to curl up on a couch under a weighted blanket, watch You've Got Mail, and devour a box of Snookers. <laughs> see what we got here. Hey, there it is. Do you like dots, Ted? Oh, they're OK. I'm more of a, you know, a cornhole man myself. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. Huh. How about a game? I mean, we could, you know, maybe wager. Say, 10,000 pounds? Well, as my doctor told me when I got addicted to fettuccine Alfredo, that's a little rich for my blood. <laughs> uh, how about this? If you win, I'll let you pick the starting lineup of the last two games of the season. But if I win, you can't go anywhere near the owner's box, at least not while Rebecca's still in charge. Ted, what are you doing? Well, I believe some folks call it white knight, but I don't know if it's falling my gut here. It's OK. Ted, so, no, go ahead. What do you think? You're wrong. Okay. Uh, double in, double out. Whatever you say, Rupert Dupes. Yeah. Just let me know if I'm winning or losing, all right? <laughs> oh, I forgot I had these on me. Oh, yeah. Oh, wait a second. I forgot I'm left handed. <gasps> oh, it's going to be a hoot. It is going to be a hoot. Is it just me or does Ted Lasso look like Ned Flanders on The Simpsons? I don't know if that's intentional or not, but maybe. Doesn't matter. What's causing the quarrels and fights among you? James goes on to say, look, God opposes the proud. I don't think you want that. God opposes selfish ambition. God opposes jealousy. God's not going to buy our excuses. God's not going to say, it's OK for you. But what he's for is ambition that leads to the good of the other, to the good of the whole. But grace gives, but God gives grace to the humble. Everyone say grace. grace. That's what makes us perfect. Scriptures say God's power is made perfect in our weaknesses when we admit we need a savior. And now that we've been set free for this new life, what are we going to do with this salvation? What are we going to do with this freedom? What are we going to do with God, what God has provided for us? Well, we can hold on to the joy even when we're being oppressed, even when we're being pushed. Doesn't mean we shouldn't work for better conditions. We absolutely should. That's part of what the body of Christ is called to be and to do. It's why we take offerings for victims of terror and war in the Middle East again this weekend. We want to be a part of the solution. We want the body of Christ to rise up. But we don't start thinking that, that it's our pride that's going to get us there. It's God's grace through our humility that sets us free. So we don't want to sound like the church lady. When James says, don't speak against each other, if you criticize each other, isn't that special? Then you're criticizing and judging God's law. What right do you have, Rupert, to judge Ted Lasso, your neighbor? Because you're richer than him? Because you have more worldly power than him? Because you have better status than he has? That's the world's way. God's way is that there's a priesthood of all believers, that the ground is level at the foot of the cross, that we're all sinners in need of a savior. And so we have the same grace for one another that God has for us. One thing flows to another. That scene where Rupert picks a fight with Ted and thinks that he can humiliate him by beating him in a game of darts, because, I mean, he's clearly a serious darts player. He walks around with a dart set, for crying out loud, that looks like it's gold-plated. But he's underestimated Ted, the country bumpkin from Kansas. 
Just like sometimes you're underestimated. Do you ever feel that way? Like if only the world would appreciate my talents. If only the world would see my gifts. If only the world would take note of uh, of how good I am at this or that or the other thing. Let me tell you something as somebody who's getting older. Even if the world notices, it won't be enough to satisfy your soul. If you think that's what you need in order to have the joy of Ted Lasso that is impenetrable from the circumstances of his life, from his wife who's dumping him, from from the media that's, that's ridiculing him and chastising him. If you think that you need all those things to get better in order for your soul to be whole, in order for you to live a satisfied life, you're missing the whole point. What God offers, what James is saying is you could have it right now because the world may or may not stop ridiculing you. They may continue to underestimate you. It doesn't matter. Because you're rooted in something deeper, in a relationship with the God who made you and loves you. And if you have that, come what may, you've got something that still produces joy despite your circumstances, despite the daily struggles that you're up against. And that doesn't just go for us individually, it goes for us collectively too. But it's so easy, as I said earlier, spiritually and emotionally lazy to criticize each other, to, to go after the other. And we have so many examples of that in our world today. So it's easy, Rupert, to criticize Ted, to see that he's a country bumpkin from Kansas. But what's sad is you're judgmental instead of curious. Billy Graham once famously said, remember, church, it's God's job job to judge. It's the Holy Spirit's job to convict. It's our job to love. The greatest commandment on the pathway of following Jesus, who is our Lord, is the Jesus who says, you can fulfill all the other laws of the Bible if you just love one another the way I've loved you. If you love God with everything you've got, heart, soul, mind, and strength, and you love your neighbor as yourself the way I've loved you, the greatest commandment is to love, is to have grace. Not only will it bless the world around us, it'll set us free, and we will develop an untouchable joy that Jesus talks about in his Sermon on the Mount that James picks up on because that's a big influence on this epistle where Jesus uses the Greek word makarioi, blessed, happy, filled with joy are those who are poor, are those who are meek, are those who are persecuted, are those who are criticized, I guess you could add too, are those who are underestimated, are those who aren't appreciated. If you've got a relationship with the God who made you, Well, that's the mirror that you look in to remember who you are. So the criticism comes and you see it for what it is. Not a vote that counts. It doesn't last. In the end, from the perspective of eternity, the only vote that counts is the vote that God gives. It's God's job to judge, Billy Graham says. The Holy Spirit's job to convict. It's our job to love. So I'm not going to leave you hanging. You've got to see the last couple of minutes of this scene. Because it's so good. The best scene in the whole series, in my humble opinion. Because Ted's been underestimated. But it's not because he's not underestimated by the end of the scene that makes him happy. He was happy while he was still being underestimated. He had joy and peace and hope. He puts a sign called belief up over the office of his locker for, for the whole soccer team to see every day. He's the one who tells his team, I believe in belief. I, I believe in hope. He says, you got a saying over here in England that says it's the hope that kills. And he tells his team, no, it's the uh, the lack of hope that kills us. So we hold on to this hope, a hope that's grounded in something deeper. We look in the mirror and we walk away and we remember who we are. Remember who you are, child of God, follower of Jesus Christ. Now live it out. And along the way, it might be fun to beat the devil at darts too. Take a look. Shall I be giving you the line-up card now, Ted? I shall be putting your Bassanya back on defence where he belongs. That's exactly what I said, didn't I? No, no, it's not all Ted's fault. My ex-wife's the one who brought the hillbilly to our shore. Hey! Better manners when I'm holding a dart. Please. Hmm. Mate, 
What do I need to win? Two triple twenties and a bullseye. <laughs> Good luck. Mm. You know, Rupert, guys have underestimated me my entire life. And for years, I never understood why. It used to really bother me. But then one day, I was driving my little boy to school, and I saw this quote by Walt Whitman. It was painted on the wall there. It said, be curious, not judgmental. I like that. So I get back in my car, and I'm driving to work. And all of a sudden, it hits me. All them fellas that used to belittle me, not a single one of them were curious. You know, they thought they had everything all figured out, and so they judged everything, and they judged everyone. And I realized that they're underestimating me. <sighs> Who I was had nothing to do with it. Because <laughs> if they were curious, they would ask questions, you know? Questions like, have you played a lot of darts, Ted? <laughs> Which I would have answered, yes, sir. Every Sunday afternoon at a sports bar with my father from age 10 to I was 16 when he passed away. Barbecue sauce. Yeah, hooray for the good guys. And so James sums it up. He says, this is the pathway to perfection. We'll never get to the point where we don't make mistakes. That's not the point. That's not what James is saying. But there's no excuse for not extending yourself to full capacity, for not pouring everything that you have, time, talents, money. If you don't have a lot of money to give, this will surprise you. We should be giving to you. I'm not going to guilt and pressure you into giving your last coins. That's not what the story at the temple is about where Jesus says, look at that woman, that widow. She just gave her last coins. If you read it in the context of the verses around it, you realize Jesus is going after the temple priests who made her feel like she had to give her last coins. But the Bible also says if you've been given much, much is expected in return. If you've got a lot of money, you should be giving a lot of money. And you should find the causes that are worthy of your donations, that further the mission that's going to set us free, the mission on a pathway to perfection. So James says, resist the devil and he will flee from you. Isn't that good news? That you don't have to be intimidated by the Ruperts of this world or by the devil himself. That if you just resist the temptation he throws at you, He'll go find something else to do. Resist him and he'll run away from you. Come close to God and God will come close to you. Don't fall back on the lazy excuse of, well, I can't change. This is just who I am. Your God's too small. You've forgotten the transformational power of Jesus Christ. And there are examples sitting all around us by the hundreds of people whose lives have been completely turned around. No more spiritual laziness. No more lame excuses. Like, well, I could never change. Actually, you could change. Resist the devil and he'll flee from you. Come close to God and God will come close to you. Let your God be big. Let your God be who God is. Wash your hands. Wash my hands of our sins. For our loyalty is divided between the world and between God. Choose. Choose this day, the Bible says, who you're going to serve. Because you can't mix it together, James says. Humble yourselves before the Lord, and he'll lift you up in honor. So I was looking for a photo to illustrate the, the whole letter of James. The looking in the mirror, and I, I googled a, a person looking in the mirror who's really happy, and she popped up, and I'm like, perfect. So I want you to go home and look in the mirror. And some of you are like, oh, I was with you until this part. I do not like looking in the mirror. Now you see what I see, by the way. I can see when you're sleeping. I can tell when you're awake. I have a very clear view of everybody up here. But to do what James says, to look beyond the surface and the shallow and the vanity of physical looks, I want you to look in the mirror deeper. I want you to consider your soul. I want you to consider your being what God has made. 
Because that's what James is getting at here. That's what scripture is teaching us here. To do these things because you remember who you are and you don't walk away and forget. If you do that, it's perfect. Not morally perfect, not mistake-free perfect. Following Jesus perfect. Being who God made you to be perfect. I'll close with just a really short clip from another movie I can't recommend. It was one of my all-time favorites called Friday Night Lights. It's halftime of the championship game, high school football championship game in Texas. High school football in Texas, if you don't know, is like a religion. Thank goodness it's not like that here in Iowa, where we don't take it seriously at all. And we don't build the most glorious stadiums on planet Earth for 16-year-olds, which is fine. I have no word from the Lord on that. But in Texas, it's a full-blown religion. So Coach Gaines, played by Billy Bob Thornton, comes to town. He's the new coach of this team that's supposed to compete for state, and they get there. Long story, a lot shorter. But there's a lot of turmoil and challenges along the way. As they move toward the state championship, the, the whole community is armchair quarterbacking the high school coach. It's on the local sports radio, and they criticize him. It's so easy to criticize. My wife and I were driving home from Minnesota a few weeks ago, and we stopped for ice cream, which is a rare treat for us because of my health issues. And, but once in a while, we figure, well, I'd rather die with ice cream than live without it. So we're, we're going <laughs> we're, we're to go that route. And so we decided to go all out, and we stopped at a fast food restaurant to drive through, spent about $4.00 on two simple vanilla cones, you know, just simple. But we were gonna make a big deal, it was a treat, it's a, it's a rare treat for us. So we, you know, get to the drive up microphone, uh, we'll take two single scoop cones. I don't know about you, but there's just something about an ice cream cone that's better than ice cream in a dish. Now that's subjective, you might have a different opinion, but to me the cone has an experience. Maybe it takes me back to childhood. I don't know what it is. Or maybe it's that last bite of an ice cream cone. You know what I'm talking about, right? Where you got the, the ice cream still chilled and cold at the bottom and, and the cones all around it and there's different, like, strains of sugar that all come together as one. And you just put it, it's just like, it's like a glimpse of heaven. It's this glorious moment. So you want that last bite. You, you get the cone so you can get that last bite. So we made the order, we come up, and the kid, 15, 16 years old, I would guess, he opens the window. It seems like he's having a little bit of trouble stringing more than three words together. But, you know, things are still developing. I don't want to be critical. You know, I love him. God bless him. And he comes out, and he hands us two dishes with ice cream cones plopped upside down, <laughs> splat right on top of the bowl. And my wife is Ted Lasso. And she's happy as can be. She's like, well, this is even better. <laughs> she knows who she is. She's looking at the mirror. I'm driving away, and I start to preach. <laughs> I'm so upset on so many levels. Why didn't he tell us this was the issue? He said, he did explain. He says, well, our soft serve machine isn't cold enough. <laughs> You're telling me now? After I wasted $4.12? Boy, do I ramp up quick sometimes when I don't remember who I am. And so I uh, started to talk about what's wrong with this fast food chain and what's wrong with the world and what's wrong with the nation that allows this to happen. <laughs> I mean, I'm preaching. I'm just, I'm just going off on all the injustice of an upside down ice cream cone. And how's gonna, I'm going to let it ruin my day if I'm not careful. Because it's easy to complain and criticize instead of wondering, I wonder what that 15-year-old kid's going through. I wonder what he's up against. I wonder what he's dealing with. I wonder if my call was to be kinder to him, to be more gracious and not just give him the silent treatment so that I could talk about him after I leave. It's not who I am. 
I mean, it's who I become when I let the world fill in the blank face and tell me what I should be living for and how complaining will make me feel better and criticizing other people and putting them down will make me feel better. But then I remember, whoa, that's really close, <laughs> who I am. I'm a child of God. So are you, church. So resist the devil. Come close to God. Wash our hands of our sins. Humble ourselves before the Lord. And he'll lift us up and we'll find our stride and we'll be who God has made us to be. Watch this clip from Friday Night Lights because the coach sounds like James. Point for point. Sip for sip through this epistle. He hits all the points. Be perfect, church. You can do this. Extend your telescope. Humble yourselves before God, James says, the coach says. Live in grace. Do everything you possibly can so you can look each other in the eye and say, there wasn't one more thing I could have done. My telescope didn't go out any further. I gave God everything I had in this life. It's halftime, metaphorically. You say, well, at my age, it's fourth quarter. Or it's first quarter. I'm just a kid. It's just a metaphor. You've got some more life to live if you're taking breath. What are you going to do with it? Humble yourself before God. Live in God's amazing grace. His power is made perfect through his grace. It's an act of not passive, passive faith. It's persevering through difficult circumstances. It's all the parts of the body of Christ together as a whole. It's hearts filled with love, centered in Christ for us as Christians. If you can do that, the coach says, you're perfect. Not without sin or mistakes or moral trips, tripping up but perfect in the sense that you're living for the right things. You look in the mirror and you remember who you are and you live it out in daily life and you don't have this disconnect between what you believe and what you're called to do. That's James' point. Take this faith, the stuff you believe in, and live it out. Live it out. Follow the example of Jesus. Love one another like that. If you do, it's going to change the world. What if the most significant thing that happened this weekend isn't that the Gophers beat the Hawkeyes on a controversial call? What if what God's really trying to do is get your attention on this? To remember who you are. To have joy whether your team wins or loses. The coach says it's not about the scoreboard out there. It's not about whether we win the state championship or not. It's about living the life that God has given you the opportunity to live and living it out faithfully. If you can do that, if you can activate your faith in this way, instead of just saying Christianity is just about what I believe, well, that's not what the Bible says. It says Christianity is about what you believe that saves you and sets you free so that you can live it out. And so we pray. I mean, if a high school football team in Texas can do it, I think that's the way we should do it too. Together, let's pray the prayer that our Lord taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Look in the mirror, church. Remember who you are. Live it out. Amen? Amen. Go in peace. Serve the Lord. You're dismissed. you got to get out of here. we got another service coming in. It's my fault. I'm sorry. We can sing as you go. Yeah.